This is Mark Mullinax, and I welcome you back to our class on Taoism, a podcast class that courses through each of the 81 verses of Tao Te Ching, episode by episode. Today's verse is number 56, Lessons in the Dust. When you listen to the ground and you put your roots down, you can hear what she says if you're listening. When you listen to the ground and you put your roots down, you can hear what she says if you're listening. The sweet sound of the river as she moves over the stones. The same song that the blood in your body sings as it weaves around your bones. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? Those who know value deeds and not words. A team of horses can't overtake the tongue. More tuck just means more problems. Ho Shang Kong. Those who grasp the truth forget about words. Those who don't practice what they talk about are no different from those who don't know. Xie Dao Cheng. The Taoist isn't talk, but it doesn't exclude talk. Those who know don't necessarily talk. And those who talk don't necessarily know. Shi Qi. My companion in this episode is Johnny Richardson, who describes himself this way. Retired veteran Qigong practitioner. Johnny is one of my students in the yearly class I teach on mindfulness and healing presence at the Taoist Traditions School of Chinese Medicine in Asheville, North Carolina. But I am privileged also to be a student. Before class, he gathers a few of us and teaches Qigong. So Johnny, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 7.30. Now later in our question and answer discussion time, I'll be asking Johnny a question. Two quotes from the Tao Te Ching have made it into our larger culture in my lifetime. Today's verse contains one of these quotes. Those who know don't speak, and those who speak don't know. The other proverbial gem comes soon in our journey in verse 64, and it talks about long journeys and first steps. Today's first proverb literally translates thus. Understanding, one does not speak. Speaking, one does not understand. Listen closely to the way it literally is translated. Understanding and speaking. Two gerunds. A geron is the ing form of a verb. In this case, understand or understanding, and speak or speaking. That functions as a noun in a sentence. It allows an action or a verb to be treated as a continuing thing or an ongoing concept. Understanding and speaking are two enduring constants, which the author puts here in verse 56 to show contrasting states. This proverb has been widely popularized and Johnny and I will read five other translations of this proverb. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. Gia Fu Fong. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. J. H. McDonald. He who knows the Tao does not care to speak about it. He who is ever ready to speak about it does not know it. James Legg. Those who know don't like to say. Those who say don't know. Jim Klatfelter. He who knows the truth does not brag. He who brags does not know the truth. Chang. So, it's time for our verse. Johnny, would you read our verse 56, please? Those with answers do not know. 
and those who know do not answer. Seal the mouth. Mistrust your senses. Smooth your rough edges to untangible complications. Soften your stare to mix with the dust of the earth. This is profound oneness. One cannot possess, approach, abandon this oneness. One may add neither benefit nor harm or honor or besmirch it. Under heaven, nothing is more prized or valued. Wise people understand the Tao, which teaches that nothing communicates like actions. Words are a poor second choice when communicating key information. For example, contrast words of love versus actions of love. Or in the context of this verse, the teaching of Tao is rarely or hardly needing words. Remember Tao Te Ching's very first teaching in verse 1? Any name one might borrow for Tao cannot summon it. Names are just sounds for ordinary things. The Taoist sage, instead of yammering and preaching what folks should do or how they should be, the sage just focuses on wordlessly doing or being Tao. I find it ironic that here we are, Johnny, trying to teach this verse 56 with words. Let me be clear. If you've stayed with this podcast, you've heard me say almost 200,000 words about something that cannot be put into words. Have I been focused more on words than quiet understanding? I hope I would be judged graciously, but as a professor, I can talk a good game. So take my words with whatever grains of salt you need. But you can no doubt recall people in your life or past who just rolled up their sleeves and did whatever needed to be done without a word. But by the end of the day, we respected the hell out of them. On the other hand, ever notice how when people who talk a lot, it turns out they usually do not know much at all? They spend so much talking, making sure they are the center of attention, that they expose their bankruptcy of deeds. Rich in words, poor in action. Talking the walk, but not walking that talk. Without putting Tao into practice, their promotion of Tao doesn't mean much. You could say that silence is not just golden, but wisdom itself. Notice how when you just observe, without interruption or talking, that you learn not just things, but the how and the why of things. That's called wisdom. Around our world, Proverbs abound around our idea that talk is required only if it improves upon the silence. And we do love to talk, as if our strutting and talking, but not our silent action, were the final word about something. This tendency for people to speak with confidence was studied by David Dunning and Justin Kruger. Their so-called Dunning-Kruger effect describes how people with low levels of competence, tend to overestimate their knowledge and act quite self-confident despite their ignorance. I'm now thinking of some politicians, maybe you are too. But our Tao Te Ching seems to point in this verse to a state that is simultaneously both confident and humble. A state where one is knowledgeable and wise. But one is not arrogant or loud about it, like tooting your own trumpet or getting high on your own supply of gossip. As one of my current students, David Chason, said to me this morning, the one who speaks most knows least. You don't need me to use words to describe this huge difference between knowing the path and walking the path. I'm trying to close that gap myself. So let's take our talk out for a walk. Exercise your talk. Give your talking part of you the workout it could use. It's a workout of silence. Perhaps the most difficult thing we might do on a daily basis. Just silencing the talk. This workout is not in some gym, but among real folks, real situations, with real other than human beings. And your quiet, wise presence in those often dusty, unpopular, and out of the way places just brings oneness and peace. How? 
by just not saying a word. You just show up. You do your Tao duty, and then you move on. Maybe you'll pause this podcast right here and try to remember when someone came to your troubled, dusty place and brought a fresh, healing, green presence that lasted long after they left the scene. Maybe it's time to thank them for what they did for you. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? As Tao followers become wise in their silence, they naturally avoid distractions and temptations in life. Our verse says this is the smoothing of your rough edges to untangle complications, softening your stare to mix with the dust of the earth. This is profound oneness. So why smooth off our edges? Why untangle our complications? As one Chinese philosopher, Huang Yan Chi, said, We seal the opening and close the gate to the nourish the breath. We dull the edge and untie the tangible to steal the spirit. We soften the light and join the dust to adopt to the times and flow of the world. Okay, curious folks, what happens when we take this advice? To smooth our edges, to untangle our complications? It's hard to explain. You'll just have to try it yourself. Going silent, mistrusting our senses, sealing the opening and closures of our body. All this means freedom with a capital F. It means that we know ourselves really to be free. Free from all those cultural preset thinkings. Free from hate and thus free from fear, doubts, confusion. We know this freedom through the wisdom of silence. And freedom, of course, is a practice. The practice of silence is how we become small, wisely small, so we can forget ourselves, so we suffer no ego injury as we join the dust of the world. To join that dust means to unite, to embrace, to help others. We cannot do that with a mouth always opened. Freed from the self-imprisonment of words, 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 we get freed up to unite and bring our best to bear in any situation. We serve others for change, for transformational change, when we stop serving our yammering self. So how do we do this? How do you smooth one's rough edges? How do you polish the gold already in? How does one polish the diamond one already is? By getting dirty in the right ways, with the right beings, or with the right other than human beings, by not being too high and mighty to, quote, get dirty, unquote, especially with what one's culture has predetermined are the wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of beings, the wrong places of the world. Back in my treatment of verse 7, I recounted how in 1987, I was once called out for not accepting the dust of the world, the underside of history, as my professor James H. Cohn called it. He was the world's premier African-American liberation theologian. You know, he was my professor at Union Seminary in New York City. He once told me something that I think about every day to this day. Because after class once, he called me up. Or rather, he called me out after class and announced, Mark, you are too white and privileged ever to be a follower of Jesus. You will never get Jesus. Cone saw the absolute horror in my face and continued his soul surgery on me. You'll use your privilege always to live apart and out of earshot from the voices of the poor and the underside of history, which is where Jesus lives. You'll never be a Christian. Forget about it. So there's a radical self-introspection here. Being dust, being with dust, is promotion. Dust grounds us. Get it? Are we willing to mix with the dust of life, the underside of society, and walk with the never privileged? If not, James Cone is still right. Forget about Jesus. Forget about Tao. Talk must turn into walk. 
Walk must then silence the talk. Inside must match outside. This is how we learn to adjust, adapt, and relearn hard lessons of joining dust. From dust we come, to dust we return. Dust is our primal reality. Why? Because we are creatures of dust, on the way to death. To befriend death is to friendship up with death. Might as well practice our dust lessons in the meantime. When you listen, eh? When you listen, eh? Are you listening? When you listen, eh? When you listen, eh? Are you listening? We can only be a gift when we are whole. And we can only be whole when silent. Silence the inner critics. Silence the shoulds, the should nots. It is good that philosophers should remind themselves now and then that they are a particle partificating on infinity. Ariel Durant. Seems to me that living wisely, to wise up, is a descent, an exploration, an adventure and going silent, going low, and going dark. By sealing the opening, we guard the exit. By closing the gate, we bar the entrance. By dulling the edge, we adjust the inside. By untying the tangle, we straighten the outside. By softening the light, we focus on ourselves. By joining the dust, we adapt to ourselves. What is devoid of exit and entrance? Inside and outside. Self and other. We call the dark union. Li Shi Qi. Li Shi Qi's dark union is a word some translators use for my phrase profound oneness. Other phrases are primal union or the secret embrace of all, or in other words, purity of heart. The path of Tao to the dust of the world is nothing less than the path of Mother Tao, a path with heart, a, a heart for others, and a path containing all the wisdom one ever needs. The practitioner of purity of heart sharpens her senses. Sight becomes insight. Hearing becomes true listening. Being with someone becomes a sacred presence. They would never use their senses to overwhelm or to take advantage of anyone or anything. They focus wisely and wordlessly on what's real and important. The dusty, not the shiny. And the more they focus on the real and important, the wiser they become. Less talk, more walk. Too much noise creates illusions. Silence brings truth. Maxi Legacy. Dow followers don't live that much in ivory castles or retreat centers, away from real people with real needs or real hurts. Instead, they stay in the world, and they even lag behind like a Buddhist bodhisattva to face the same problems as the dusty class faces, whether it's poverty, loneliness, poor health care, living in someone's idea of a closet, wordlessly they accompany. Wisely, they seal their senses that feed only the ego. The first is not just last, in Jesus' words. The one wanting to be first is lost. Lost in their ego fever, dreams, and their yakety yakking. The last, that is the wise in Tao, are the first to accompany the least. The last never leave their post. They just accompany, so no piece of dust is left behind. Are we really ready for this? When we are ready, Silent Tao is already there, at one with us, within. This capital O oneness is Tao's already present embrace. One we know in silence, in the closing off of their antenna of our senses and settling back into our original state. There's nothing to strive for, nor anything we may seek to acquire. This silent wisdom, this confident and profound oneness melts away our tensions, dissolves our problems, and unties all our knots. 
This is the balanced life, this oneness. Balancing life with wisdom is called oneness. A oneness that cannot be possessed, abandoned, or corrupted. Simplicity of purpose. Living honestly with all. Folks who understand oneness can live fully in the world, but they're also peaceful and calm inside. But that inside somehow gets outside. It leaks back into culture, and it changes culture's weather, its ethics, its ethos into the ways of peace. It's simple. It's much simpler to live in silent unity naturally than try to be an unnatural word and work freak about everything and everybody. You see, living without wisdom and silence is the hardest thing to do. That may sound strange, but let me explain. I'm going to repeat it. Our separation from Tao and its innocence is the hardest work we do. Why? Because when forgetful of or separated from our original self, we live the hardest life imaginable. It's like we clog the roots of Tao from which we grow, and consciously or not, we replace those natural, simple roots with temporary, shallow, and artificial commitments. Difficult ones, every one. So here's my shortest possible conclusion. My bumper sticker conclusion. Talking ain't walking. The power of silence is that it can go anywhere and earn respect from everyone. That's all. Ready for some homework, folks? Today, try for an hour just being silent. Then tomorrow, two hours. Next day, three. Stay with three a day, three hours a day for a week, and see what wisdom flows in. Discern where or how it's difficult. Can you converse with yourself about why it has been difficult? Maybe it helps to see one's thoughts and words like water gushing out of a spigot. A spigot that one can learn to turn off. Now, as I sometimes do, before I question, I'll end with a child-friendly version of verse 56, which I'm calling this time, Mixing with the Dusty. People who think they know everything don't really understand a thing. And those who truly understand don't stand for endlessly explaining stuff. They just like to listen and grow wise. Be quiet. And rather than trust everything your senses tell you, trust the confidence of Tao in you. Calm yourself and smooth out your rough spots so life isn't so tricky. Relax and live simply, blending with all the earth like dust, like the dust that it is. This is deep wisdom. This is oneness. You can't own it. Get closer to it. You can't even walk away from it. You can't make it better or worse. And no one can give it more respect or take its value away. Under the sky, nothing is more precious than this special oneness you just can't explain. Now usually, at this time, my quote reader asks me a question. But with his permission... I'd like instead to be Johnny Richardson's student and ask a question I've often wondered about. May I do that, Johnny? Yes, please. All right, here goes. In Taoism, Johnny, there's this clear emphasis on movement as seen in practices like martial arts and Tai Chi, which can be understood as methods of cultivating boundless power through intentional motion. When you teach me Qigong, Johnny, it feels like there's this deep connection between external movements and inner states of being. How do you perceive the relationship between physical movements, inner states, and Tao itself? How do these elements interact to guide one towards harmony with the Tao? In other words, how does action, our body movements, and Tao relate? Thank you, Mark. Um... I think I first want to start off with the hard. So, as we know, the Tao can't be spoken of. But my lived experience would say that if you absolutely had to have a syllable or vibration to the Tao, I would say the all or oneness, which is conveniently the subject. 
of today. Um, and if you look at the symbol of Tai Chi, it is actually supposed to be moved. It's not a stagnant portrayal of the yin and the yang in the Tao. Yeah. Yeah. And as a student and always a student, one is stillness and one is movement. And the idea of having stillness with movement is the symbol of the Tai Chi moving. The idea is to be mindful in everything you do, including your movement, not just during still times. And they are both paths back to the oneness and then the essence of Tao that can't be spoken. Is my journey and lessons that, that I have come to understand with Taoist uh, movement and and Taoist movement is, is mindfulness movement. Yeah. So a person that practices mindfulness, if they do it in anything, yeah. it is Qigong. The broader perspective of Qigong is intention, breath, and movement. And meditation speaks for itself, and I'm sure you have had a podcast on that already. <laughs> so so to, to clarify for me, so when I'm tomorrow morning in our Qigong exercise, it's the actions themselves are not magical in themselves. I'm not doing something in a prescribed ritualistic form that then produces this alchemical or magical result. It's rather me being aware of my body in that second, especially as it's moving from one place to the other. It's the awareness is the thing. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, but the first portion of what you expressed is also true. Oh. It's a balance of wisdom and intelligence. So there is an intentional ringing of the tissue in the body to intentionally direct the chi to a certain part of your body. So there is an intelligence to the movement, but it also is a mindfulness movement. I see. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that, that, that helps me a lot. And I hope it helps the listeners, too, that uh, doing Taoist movement is a way of uh, becoming wise and, and learning uh, the oneness again, uh, just by being silent. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mark. This podcast is an original work, designed, written, and produced by many. I had a blast with the help of Johnny Richardson at the microphone here. Audrey Davis produced this podcast's artwork. The song Put Your Roots Down is graciously provided by Molly Hartful. The copyright for quotations from Dada Ching is held by Fortress Press. May your days begin rooted in silence and peace so you may know and practice hope in the dusty places of your world, a hope which our world is in great need of. <laughs>